This is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. I have another exciting episode for you today. Today, what I'm doing on a Saturday morning here, 10 a.m., we're getting to go to a beekeeping class. So yes, I will start hopefully keeping bees this year. I'm going to a beekeeping class. This actually came up on our Groupon deal where you pay uh, one amount of money and you get to bring two people, save some money to a beekeeping class for three hours on a lady that teaches organic beekeeping. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the class now and then later I'm gonna go ahead and uh, if I can, give you guys a summary of the class and also maybe even interview the teacher to uh, have her answer some questions about beekeeping for you guys. And I would encourage you to actually keep some bees if you can and learn about it because bees are essential to nature. They're an integral part of nature and my whole concept in gardening is basically, you know, grow things the natural way, grow things how nature would do it, but we want to set up the right conditions for our plants to grow so our plants could be as healthy as they can be and when the plants are healthy they're going to produce more for you but they're also going to be more disease resistant and bringing in the bees which pollinate uh, one third of all the nuts fruits and vegetables uh, can definitely increase your yield substantially so that's why i'm here oh plus as a side benefit you'll get the honey as well so anyways i'm here to learn about it and uh, anyways i'm going to go inside and uh, get the class and afterwards we'll be back at you all right, so I had a great time at beekeeping class today. The instructor was Randy Sue Collins. She's been doing this for many years and she's absolutely amazing. Learned a whole bunch of stuff that I never knew about bees. And you know, I really learned that bees are super critical and important in your garden, but also just in nature. What I'm gonna do now with you guys is share a few things that I've learned today. And uh, we'll even get a uh, Randy Sue answering some questions at the end of this video. First, I wanna talk about, uh, besides the hives here, which I'll go over in a second. They got we got three different kinds of hives here. Now, I want to talk about bees in general. So we learned today about wasps. You know, wasps live in the ground and actually they're, they don't do anything really for your flowers except hover around and they kind of make a frequency noise as they're hovering around. And guess what? When they hear that frequency noise or whatever they're generating, then other pests like drop off because they, they think something might be going on. So, you know, maybe that's how frequencies and, uh, you know, wasps can help in your garden. But the wasps live in the ground and actually they feast on, like, a decaying flesh. So that's not too fun. Another insect that is beneficial for your garden is the standard bumblebee. They're uh, pollinators as well. They also live in the ground. But what we learned about today is the uh, honeybee. And this is a picture of the honeybee here. You know, it definitely looks different than the bumblebee right there and also much different than the, uh, the wasp here or yellow jacket. So the, the bees are very beneficial because they're not only pollinators, but they will produce honey. And I would only encourage you to harvest honey, uh, you know, that's extra honey for the bees. In my opinion, there's many unsustainable, conventional and, you know, agricultural farming going on where we're unsustainably growing crops, but there's also a lot of unsustainable uh, you know, honey harvesting and exploitation literally of the bees going on as well that I do not advocate or support. By having your own bees, you can sustainably grow and raise and harvest the honey out of the bees and keep the bee population healthy. One of the things we learned today is that bees are literally shipped around the country, if not the world, uh, basically pollinating different crops. So if you're eating something like almonds, which 90% of the American almonds comes from California, you're, they're, they've been using enslaved bees that are sh being shipped literally around the country to pollinate the different crops. And once again, that has to happen because of the monoculture. If they left the bees in one area, like in the almond fields all year long, there won't be enough food for the honeybees because you know the almond trees only flower one time a year and that's when they're needed. When they're not needed, then they're moved to something else. So if you have a diversity of crops, including fruit trees and vegetables at your place, you're gonna definitely provide food for your bees all year long. So uh, next, what I want to talk about is the hives because we learned today is that we're basically stewards and we're going to basically kind of like be the landlords of the, of the bees and we need to provide a space for them and make sure they have enough space. So we'll have to control that space either by having a lot of space for them or a little bit of space for them depending on the time of year and how they're doing 
as well. So uh, let's take a look at some of the different hive options. Now let's talk about hives. So when you're gonna wanna keep bees, you're gonna have to have a place for them to stay. If you're lucky enough to have a hollowed out tree in your yard, well, they could definitely live in there, but then you probably won't be able to easily uh, harvest the honey from them. Uh, so you probably wanna uh, purchase or build your own hive. They're made out of wood, and uh, depending on your uh, wood shop skills, you know, you may want to build them because it'd be a lot less expensive, but you also may want to purchase them as well. And there are basically a three main types of hives. This one's actually called a top bar hive used in Africa. And as we learned today, uh, you know, these initially were made because in Africa they don't have a lot of resources and they would actually use like a 55 gallon drums sawed off and put sideways to make this kind of hive. The next hive we're going to talk about is the hex hive. And uh, this has been used for over 300 years, I think, in like other countries. But this uh, particular design of this hex hive has actually been patented by the instructor, uh, you know, uh, Randy Sue Collins today. And then, um, let's see, finally, you've got the standard Langstroth hive. And this is probably the beehive that you're most uh, familiar with. This was actually painted for the uh, Heirloom Expo that was there last year. And uh, normally, you don't need to necessarily paint your hives except for maybe the... Uh, the edges, you know, to, to, to make sure that it's, uh, you know, pretty sealed up pretty well. And also there's a top. In addition, you could also get uh, what's called a nuke box or a swarm box or swarm hive. And this is basically a temporary uh, uh, cardboard box. It looks like it has like basically a waxed finish uh, to capture a swarm. And so that's the best way that the instructor today said to uh, get your own bees is to capture a swarm. It's the most natural way and how nature would do it. While you can order, you know, basically bees in a box that would be delivered to you, that's probably one of the worst ways to do it. But, you know, it's probably better to have some bees than not have bees. But once again, contact a local beekeeper or join your local, uh, you know, beekeeping association to learn more about swarms and how to secure your own bees instead of ordering them. And let's see, next let's go over each of the different kinds of boxes. This is one of them right here. So this is just a temporary box. Say you have a swarm, a swarm looks like this. And if you've seen like, you know, Hollywood, they sensationalize swarms and all this stuff. But basically a swarm is when the colony gets too big, usually around the springtime. And you know, basically they divide and half the uh, bee colony stays in the current uh, box. And then the other half basically, uh, follows the queen bee out and they basically uh, protect the queen bee and now they're looking for a new place to live. So you can easily provide them a place to live and if you do have an empty hive set up ready to go, they may just inhabit it. I don't know the chances of that happening. But uh, you know, normally what happens is there's a swarm, you'll see the swarm in a tree or whatever and you're basically just going to cut off the branch of the tree and you're going to put that branch with the swarm in it and uh, you know, put it in the box. Once you get the bees in there from the branch, you're gonna put them in there and then you're gonna wanna put the uh, open frames in with some starter uh, comb on there and that'll give them the idea, hey, you know, this is where you guys need to make the comb. And then you're gonna put this in there and then you're gonna put the top on and hopefully you did this in the morning. Then what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna make sure the plug in the front of the box is open and you're going to basically uh, come leave this open all day so that any straggler bees that you know weren't you didn't get in the box will actually go into the box to join their family or their colony and then you're going to basically take off and then you're going to leave them there all day and then late at night you're going to come back and you're going to put the plug in so that now all the bees are in there and then now you're going to take some duct tape and tape up the seams and the top on because it will be no fun that if you're transporting this in your car that the bees get out and are start flying around in your car. Then once you got this home, the next day you can then basically take out this and you're gonna, all the bees will have maybe even started uh, basically forming some uh, comb. You're gonna take this and put it into your real hive. So that by far is the best way to uh, you know, get your bees and that's what I learned today and that's what I'd actually recommend because it's nature's way of doing it. Uh, next, we're going to go over and show you the hives real quick. So now we're going to go over the different hive options that you have available. This is the Langstroth hive, and this is the standard, you know, like a rectangular hive. On the top, there's a top, you know, it's a waterproof or, you know, rain can't get in there. You don't want to flood out your bees. Next, you have this uh, inner cover here that usually has some little air ventilation. Now, that, the air ventilation is very important. You're going to take that off. And then inside here, there's uh, different kinds of... 
uh, frames. And these are a closed frame right here. And this is the closed frame with a little starter um, comb there to let the bees, give the bees the idea that that's where they're supposed to start making the comb and filling it with honey. Uh, here's one that's already, you know, starting to go a little bit. Now this is 100% produced by the bees. One of the things I learned today is that these honeycomb are not just straight, they're actually angled up a little bit so that the honey actually doesn't just fall out. Now it's just a slight angle. So when, uh, you know, taken out to inspect your comb, which we actually learned that you shouldn't really do that often at all, you don't want to just be flipping it over <laughs> like that. Because <laughs> there also may be bees on here and also the honey and things may start to, to drip out. So you want to just take and turn it around like that. Another thing we learned today about this kind of box is that, you know, you want to have, uh, you know, uh, the different sizes. So this is the uh, medium size and these are called supers and then there's a large size that's a lot deeper. And so you want to use the standard uh, medium size, what we learned today. And then on here, let's go ahead and take one level off here. Another thing we learned today is, you know, how to keep the bees. So, you know, normal uh, beekeepers may have a frame in each of the supers. And what we learned is you want to have basically an empty super at the bottom. And you want to just put in frames that are open on the bottom because then this will happen. The bees will start to make the comb and fill it with the brood and the, the honey and whatnot and just go all the way down. So this is where the normal frame would end. And this is the box where basically, hopefully the queen will stay, but also it gives the uh, bees a good base of their home. Another thing we learned today is that once you uh, get a base like this, you're gonna add another one like we just had on there. And now this is the home for the bees alone. And you're never gonna wanna harvest honey from this because this is what the bees need, you know, at a minimum to stay alive all year long. Another thing that was actually really important is that most commercial bee operations may feed their bees sugar water. And the sugar water ends up to be the honey. And then if you buy honey, um, then that honey is derived from either sugar water or even worse, high fructose corn syrup. So for that reason alone, I would encourage you to purchase honey from you know, your local beekeeper or at you know, your local farmer's market or better yet, have your own. But once you've got a nice stable uh, bees in your hive here, this last box up on top, you could put you know, four, you could even go a lot taller. But on this fourth box, this is the one that if the bees are producing honey in, then you can harvest from, because this is like what the excess is. So uh, that's what's cool. You may not make a lot of honey your first year, but maybe in your second year, you definitely will. And once again, hopefully you're not keeping bees for the honey, you're keeping them for the pollination and the honey is actually the side benefit. But the next thing we're gonna talk about is the hex hive. Now the hex hive works pretty much like this hive, pretty much the same way, but it's a lot more convenient and more like nature. One of the things I liked about the instructor today is that she, like me, believes that we should model nature in, you know, when growing crops, or in her case, uh, growing bees or keeping bees. And in nature, you know, there are no rectangular beehives in nature, <laughs> unless there's some rectangular trees that I've never seen. Um, but in nature, you know, the bees will live in a tree and they're pretty much round. So this hex hive more approximates the natural order of things and how bees would live in nature. So this one's really cool. It has actually almost, it looks really cool, number one. And number two, it has a nice uh, copper top here. And uh, there's venting here in the lid as well. And if we take off one of these guys, we can kind of see, you know, you pretty much still have your standard frames and the, uh, the corner frames here on the edges are basically tacked in. And this is gonna be basically solid frames for the beads at all times, they're gonna stay in there. Then you have these much more smaller manageable frames that are really easy to pull in and pull out. And we also learned that bees kept in this fashion more like in nature would be more gentle because you know they're not already uptight because they're living in a space that they normally wouldn't be living in nature. So I really like this a lot uh, to learn, oh and the other thing about this hive is that this hive is made with uh, cedar wood. Uh, many other, and actually, it smells nice, many other uh, hives are made out of pine. And the other thing that uh, is a new innovation is that besides being this design, on the inside it's actually a rough cedar and on the outside is a smooth cedar. And one of the things that the bees do is that they'll basically uh, collect propolis 
from the plants, which is antibacterial, and they'll, they coat the inside of the hives with it, and hopefully by having a rough surface, they'll actually fill this in with propolis, and the propolis basically makes their environment sterile. And so that may result in a healthier bees overall. And once again, that is how nature works. Finally, there's the top bar hive here. And one of the things I really like about the top bar hive is right here, you have a little viewing window. And that's because, you know, in the top bar hive, you may need to manage your beehives more because there is a little board here that you could segment up or down how big the space is that the bees are living in. Let's go ahead and pull this uh, top a piece off here. In the top bar hive it has all these bars and actually these are the bars and in the top bar hive it basically has the uh, the bar and then it has this little uh, piece of wood here that the bees will start to form their honeycomb on. And uh, there's so many different bars in here and what happens is you got to have a board like this because if you just give the bees space to make comb in, they'll make comb in any old fashion that they see fit. They won't actually do it the way you want to. And let me show you actually guys what happens if you don't fill up and uh, control the space well. This is standard Langstroth hive here and what happened was, you know, no boards or um, frames were put in this area and you could see here that, you know, here's a frame that was nicely developed because it was in here, but in this area where there's no frames, all the honeycomb got made in some weird fashions. And this, you know, it's not really too functional because you can't get it out. You can't harvest anything from there. And uh, I mean, I think it looks pretty cool, but not too functional. So that's why you really need to maintain the space inside your hives, uh, and that's very important. And in the top bar hive, you're gonna have to do that a little bit more often. In this hive, what you need to do is you need to give the bees a certain amount of space and then put this guy down in there. So now you've basically blocked them into one half and as the colony expands, then you can move this board down and expand it down. So I won't get into anything further about the different hives. You know, there are pros and cons to every hive, just like there's pros and cons to different growing practices and pros and cons to juice different juicers and Pros and cons are a lot of things, but I will say that overall, I think I prefer the hex hive. It just kind of makes definitely more sense to me overall. Uh, if you want to learn more about the hex hive, you can learn more at uh, thanknature.com. Next, we're going to talk with Randy Sue, which, who is the instructor and the organic beekeeper, and we're going to ask her a few questions. So now we're here at the instructor, Randy Sue Collin, and I want to ask her, you know, why did you get into organic beekeeping? Um, I got into organic beekeeping originally because when I first got into beekeeping I noticed how many people weren't doing things naturally and I always questioned that and most of the beekeeping that most people know about is the conventional beekeeping where they use chemicals and medications and they feed their bees and when I started keeping my bees I realized that's not how I wanted to keep bees and I realized there was a lot of people that didn't know that that was even possible to keep bees naturally so this is why I'm always uh, I'm, this is why I'm also uh, offering these classes of organic introduction to organic beekeeping and also created the video Organic Beekeeping 101 so people actually around the world could learn how to keep bees naturally and uh, have actually more gentler bees by doing things and following nature's processes instead of trying to force things and control things. So tell me about the hex hive. The hex hive, right, is a way that bees can be more gentler because it's more natural, right? How did exactly. you come up with that? Well, the hex hive, when I first got into keeping bees, I always asked myself, what is the most natural environment for bees? And I realized it wasn't, wasn't rectangular boxes. It was a round environment, like a cavity in a tree. So I thought, well, what could I do to emulate the more natural environment? And this hex hive actually was a shower-inspired idea. And I was in the shower one day and I was thinking about it and all of a sudden it occurred to me, well make a beehive that's hexagonal shaped, which is six sided, which is the same shape that the bees build their honeycomb cells. And I thought, why not emulate exactly what they're doing already? So I did, so I went through a few prototypes, I went online and I um, applied for the trademark for Hex Hive and I got the registered trademark for that and created this hive and worked with a friend of mine who uh, builds houses and he has all the equipment he needs for this and um, decided to apply for a patent for the design which I did get approved at the end of last year so now I have a des uh, patent design on here as well and then I found out because I originally looked online to see if anybody else was doing hex hives and I didn't see 
anybody online at all doing hex highs. So I started doing it, blogging about it, put mine up for sale, and I also needed to emulate a Langstroth hive in having removable frames. In order to be legal in the United States, we have to be able to inspect our comb, which means removable frames. So I had to incorporate that into the design as well, which it does have, and it works beautifully. And I also wanted to have individual entrances at each super so the bees don't have to work so hard by crawling in just the bottom one and climbing up five stories in order to get to the top comb. And I do find that they do use each of the entrances. So it helps reduce a little bit of stress on them too because their lifespan is so short. And what I'm really excited about with our latest design of the Hex Hive is the cedar wood. And it is the rough interior that I'm really, really excited about right now because I do truly believe that this is going to create a healthy and healthier environment for any colony that lives inside the hex hive. And I do find gentler bees live in here. And I think it's a rounded environment. They even say in a rounded house, people have a different energy in a rounded house. They seem to be more calm, less stressed because the energy in the air just flows very smoothly. It doesn't get stuck anywhere. And uh, it seems to be working beautifully, and I, know, I don't use smoke when I go into my hives on my bees, and I find that I never even, it never even occurred to me to have to use it in a hex hive. Every time I open the lid on a hex hive, these bees are so calm and so gentle. It's totally unnecessary. That sounds really great. So tell me one more tip that you want to give my viewers about how to have gentle bees. Follow nature's practices and configure your hives the way that I configure my hives, which means the bottom super is empty and the second super above that has the bottomless frame so they can build this really long uninterrupted comb that the queen loves to lay eggs in. That's really one of the secrets to having a gentler hive. And try not to feed them if you don't have to. And if you do feel the need to feed bees, please use this bi biodynamic BT that is offered online. It has nutrition in it. It's not just a flat sugar water or, heaven forbid, high fructose corn syrup solution. And um, let the bees do the work. The bees have been around for millions of years. They know what they're doing, so let them do it. And also let them, my biggest thing that I'm trying to get across to people is to stop spraying and allow nature to take its course and to let the bees do the work and let them build up their own defenses naturally because they will be able to defend off any pathogens and parasites themselves over time if we allow them to do that. If you want to learn more about some of the secrets about Randy Sue's uh, organic beekeeping, I would highly encourage you to pick this DVD up. Actually, I picked this up today. I'm going to be watching the whole thing. And after this, I'll be much more aware of how to do it in a natural and sustainable way. It's uh, Organic Beekeeping 101 with Randy Sue. This is available at OrganicBeekeeping101.com. This will probably be the number one best investment you can make if you want to keep some organic bees. All right, Randy, well, I appreciate the time here today. Thank you so much for all your information. I've loved it, and hopefully my viewers will also love it too. And go out and get this DVD, learn about organic beekeeping. There is a better way. Once again, follow nature. So I hope you enjoyed this episode learning more about organic beekeeping. I've enjoyed my time here today, and I wanna encourage you to keep your own bees, or at least just learn about how to do it so that when you are ready, you can definitely keep your bees to increase the pollination and grow more food at home. Once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. Remember, keep on growing.